James O'Neill, you're here with O'Neill Ops. Today we're taking a look at an all new upgraded version of the CR model, the Mark I. A lot of you guys will notice that the manufacturer's components on the CR Mod O are going to be the same manufacturers that we chose for the Mark I. They're just literally upgraded versions. Taking a look, jumping right into the stock here. You guys will visually notice this is the Manners T5A by its distinct thumb hole. What you won't notice is this wears the Manners Elite Shell. The Elite Shell is a carbon fiber shell that eliminates a pound off of the traditional T5A. I really don't get into a lot of detail on the thumb hole, but the best way I can explain it is it's very ergonomic and very comfortable. If you took a handful of modeling clay and gripped it, that's how this stock would feel in your hand. Towards the rear bottom of the stock, you'll notice the thumb hook, which we do use a lot. We like to, to get into prone positions, primarily if the situation allows, but what the thumb hook does is in, in a couple different shooting positions, it allows you to use your non-trigger hand, obviously, hook it into that thumb hook and pull your stock into your shoulder pocket. And not only does it give what I feel is a, a more steady shot, but it allows you to maneuver a little bit. With the, the more vertical grip that the T5A gives you, coupling that with the thumb hook, pulling it into your shoulder, it allows you to make a transition from targets a little bit easier, especially when you're hunting coyotes like us in the prone position. Moving up to the top, you'll notice the elevated cheek piece, the adjustable cheek piece on the T5A. And I'm going to be going over this and taking a couple minutes and describing in detail why we choose this option because we do get a lot of guys that ask why we need it. And it is just that. We, we need it. It's a necessity for us. And I'll explain it to you. We run heavier than average contoured barrels. Most of our barrels are at least an M24 contour. We run larger objective optics as well as 20 MOA canned bases. When you couple all three of those together, you have to significantly increase sight height to elevate your optic above your barrel. Another thing that a lot of guys overlook is with a 20 MOA canted base, what that essentially does is it angles your objective down and your ocular lens up, your eyepiece up. And that leaves you with trying to get uh, decent eye relief, proper cheek weld. Without a piece of a, a hardware like this, you're literally left trying to get a proper cheek weld with your cheek way up high, trying to sight through, and you don't have a natural point of aim. So for, for how we set our rifles up, the adjustable cheek piece is a, is a necessity, 100% a necessity, because it allows us to get a natural point of aim, it allows us to get an anchor point, it allows us to get a proper cheek weld, 
in every single position that we get ourselves into. Looking at the hardware itself, you can see two machined rods. One of them is, is machined with ribs and it has a locking washer that acts as a locking collar that you can remove and custom set on different settings. And what that does is when you need to remove this cheek piece to pull the bolt or to you know, insert a rod guide to clean the bore, when you set the cheek piece back in, it's, to, it's at your custom setting. You just drop it in, it stops at your proper height, and you're ready to go. On the left-hand side of the stock, we had Manners install two flush cups for QD swivels. That's so that if you want to, or if we want to, we can run a sling on the left-hand side. The reason that they are on the left-hand side is because we are right-handed shooters and we've got an oversized bolt that we don't want rubbing in our back if we do decide to sling up. Moving down here, this is something a little bit different, guys. We went with the Manners Gen 2 mini chassis and I'm gonna go over and kind of explain to you guys why we decided to choose this option and, and really why we like it. First off, you'll notice that the mag release, it is ambidextrous and it's contoured and machined with the trigger guard, which you know I really like that it's integrated because less things to hang up. The Gen 1 has a mag release that sticks down a little bit and we have had it hang up. Nothing, nothing bad, but it's just less things to snag on. You can run it right-handed, left-handed, right thumb, left thumb, whichever is easier for you. And you'll also notice that the option that I went with was the extended magwell. And I'm gonna go into detail here and kind of explain to you guys why we chose the extended magwell versus the more flush magwell. A, a lot of bottom metal manufacturers, they machine the magwell with a little bit looser tolerance and rightfully so. I mean, when you're out in the field hunting or shooting, the last thing that you want to do is, is get your magazine dirty or your mag well dirty and then not be able to operate it, not be able to do a mag change or mag swap or whatever. So with a little looser tolerance, what do you get? You get a magazine that has, it's prone to rattling. You know, Manners has been awful good with their tolerances, but if you do hit it, it, it does make a rattle. And when we're hunting coyotes, I mean, a lot of people don't understand that we're hunting an animal that sees, hears, and smells millions of times better than us we will take every advantage that we possibly can. And I really think of something like this as an advantage for us. And with the extended magwell, the way I look at it is as a shield. And there's been a couple times at night where we were hunting and we had a coyote coming in, we were proned out in sandburst. And the coyote went down a little bit too low for us to make a prone shot. So we got up into a fence line and we actually used the extended magwell it's kind of a uh, to barricade up into uh, the barbed wire. You know, we, we, we stuck the muzzle through the two middle uh, barbed wires on a four strand fence and pushed it up into a barbed wire. And I think that without that, you know, it would have been up against the magazine and would have made a little bit of a rattle. And I kind of look at this as a shield, whether we need to, to change our shooting position and kind of put our finger up against this and move without hitting our mag and making a noise. Another thing too, at night, we do a lot of hunting with these at night. We equip these rifles with thermals and we know pretty much all of our equipment by memory. And being able to just slide your hand down the forehand and hit the extended magwell gives you an easy, an easy reference point when you need to do a mag change. Last thing on the stock here, fellas, this is a machined pick rail from Long Rifles Inc. The, the bolt pattern matches up to the Manor stock. It's like a 30 second install. It also has a machined flush cup for a quick detach swivel so you can run a sling in a more traditional fashion if you want. The reason that we use it is for bipods. Moving on from the LRI pick rail, let's go right into the bipods. We do carry two bipods with this all the time, one for prone and one for seated or kneeling. All of our bipods are fitted with the ADM QD mount so that we can make a, a bipod swap in a matter of seconds. You put it on the pick rail, you throw the lever, and, and there you go, you're set. The reason that we carry multiple bipods is because we, I mean, one of the most fun things that we do is we just throw our stuff on and go. We don't really scout our areas. We know where we're hunting, that there's coyotes. We know there's animals there, and being able to get into positions that we can adapt to, it just, just it gives us that much more success. This bipod is the Harris S 13 to 27. We also carry the Harris S 
12 to 25 for seated and kneeling. For the prone shots, we carry the Harris S6 to 9, and this particular version or this particular model is the Atlas BT10 LW17. And fully, fully compact, this is four and three quarter inches. Fully extended, it's nine inches. Before we get started on the action, I kind of want to fill you guys in on, on the, the amount of time that we've had behind this rifle. I know a lot of guys want to see reviews, they want to see videos all the time, but you know, we're, we're not all about unboxings. It's been approximately one year to date that Keith and I went to Zermatt Tools, Bighorn Arms in Bennett, Nebraska, right outside, right outside of Lincoln and toured their facilities. And you know, it's, it, it puts a different perspective on things from our point of view. It, it really humbles us and it's uh, a lot of fun to be able to work with bigger companies like this. You know, unfortunately, a lot of guys see a piece of equipment and, and they automatically just put a price tag to it and they don't understand the amount of money that these guys ha have tied up, the amount of risks that they take, the, the machines that they're able to operate and, and manufacture something of this magnitude. You know, it, it's, it's the backbone of the world, manufacturing, making stuff. And it really, it humbles us and we're real fortunate to be able to work with a lot of these companies. So this action is the Bighorn Arms SR3. It's threaded an inch and a sixteenth by 20 catered to the Savage small shank prefit barrels and we'll get into that a little bit later on but this noticeably has an opened up ejection port and that's primarily designed for top feeding although we won't be using it because we've got a bottom metal uh, a magazine system here this action is is kind of designed for the ADL, BDL, BDL style hinged floor plates. The reason I really like the, the opened up ejection port is because you can get your finger in there, you can clean the raceway really easy. If you did get any junk or debris in there, it's, it's easy to get at and easy to clean. This does come with a 20 MOA canted base from Bighorn Arms. This action does have an integrated recoil lug. Looking at the bolt, on the left hand side of the action there's the bolt release button pull it remove the bolt taking a detailed look at the bolt here it's fluted we prefer fluted bolts we run in a lot of dirty conditions especially hunting a lot of that dirt and moisture congregate to those to those flutes allowing you to operate the bolt freely and easily it's got a machined helical diamond pattern oversized bolt knob you know, it, a, lot of, a lot of times you get into, into situations, your adrenaline's going, or you got gloves on and it's cold, just makes it a little bit easier to operate that bolt. Um, you know, taking a, a little bit closer look at the bolt, this does have what they call a bayonet style firing pin. It's a quarter of a turn, and the firing pin assembly is released. This bolt is, is kind of similar to an AR style bolt. You can see this pin right here on the kind of towards the bolt face you pop that pin out which I'm not going to do and it allows you to rem remove the floating bolt head and getting into a little bit of detail on that the uh, going back to the the thread pitch at the beginning of the or at the front of the of the action what you could essentially do is have three rifles in one if you want to and I'll try to try to explain that real quick for a lot of guys that, that may not want to spend a lot of money on on two or three actions what you can do is you can swap the, the floating bolt head out you got a 223 bolt face a 308 bolt face and a magnum bolt face you can have three savage small shank prefit barrels have them properly head spaced in correlating uh, chamberings to your bolt heads you know 223 a 6.5 creedmoor and a 300 short action ultra mag and torque the barrel down put the proper bolt face bolt head on and you've got a whole different rifle so you could have multiple rifles in one for us you know we'll just build a rifle if we want to but for those guys out there that may want to have that option it, it's there for you this has uh you know taking a, another look at this bolt this has a uh floating bolt head that does keep 
the recoil lugs, 100% in 100% contact. Inside the action, we'll try and get some shots of this. It has a mechanical ejector inside there. And, and that's, that's really nice. The harder you run the bolt, the further your case will fly. You can run this bolt really easy and it'll fall right in your hand. And it, there's, there's low failure. I mean, I've had the, the ejector plungers go down, get a weak spring, you get your case flipping around inside your action and sometimes it'll screw you up. It's not the case with this setup. Towards the rear of the action, they give you three options of tanks. They've got a, a trim tang, which this is. This flowed with the rifle and the design that we wanted. They have a medium and then a heavy tang. You guys can kind of see the options on their website, but I'll try to post the picture up and uh, show you guys the different options in, in the tang features that they have. Just a nice way to kind of finish off and customize the action to, to what you like. Moving down here, we have a Timney trigger. This is the Model 510. First time we've ever ran Timneys. You know, we've been kind of jewel guys, and one of the distinct differences is the width of this trigger. I'd say this trigger is probably twice as wide as the as the jewels. And I mean, there's a lot of surface area for your finger. I was kind of skeptical at first, but man, it's really comfortable and it's got a different break. I mean, it's got a crisp, just a crisp snap. You know, great trigger, nice trigger. I'm sure we'll be uh, getting more of those for, for our future custom builds. This is the, the USO B17. And on the model review that we've got up online, I was running the Night Force NXS 3.5 to 15, which I'll note shortly after that, that video, after that review, we, what I would call upgraded to the LR17. This particular model, for those of you guys that aren't familiar, is the successor to the LR17. And I'll kind of go into some features here real quick on this optic for you. The, uh, the, the magnification on this optic is 3.2 at the low end to 17 on the high end. It's still got the high quality glass. It's got a 34 millimeter tube. The, the objective is 50 millimeters on the glass, but the outside diameter is probably a little bit more important for a lot of you guys that are mounting them, is 58 millimeters. These are the standard height USO rings. Uh, one thing that I like about this optic is the integrated illumination knob with the parallax. On the LR17, there's, there's literally two different knobs on the left hand side, one for your illuminated controls or your illumination controls and the other for your parallax. This, they're integrated. You've got the parallax adjustment here and then you've got a button to turn and adjust your illumination right inside of it. Another really, uh, an awesome feature that USO did uh, they, that they added to this optic that, that I, I'm, I'm really jacked about is they, they added a locking windage turret so in order to operate it, you pull it out and you can then manually dial for wind. Push it in and it locks it. It's really easy to zero it. You, you push it in and it's locked. There are two adjacent uh, set screws, one on each side. Stick an Allen wrench in there, loosen, loosen it. It, it uh, frees up the internals, pull it out, set it to zero, push it back in and tighten both bolts and your or tighten both set screws and you're you're zeroed your wind is just is zeroed and the same principle applies to your elevation turret you know i, I really like the erect knob the profile of it how it's a little bit bigger diameter but it's a low profile especially how how we hunt with our stock packs it the the profile fits inside nothing to hang up it's it's a really nice low profile optic uh, the, the one, a couple of the features on the EREC knob that I really like are how easy you can reset the turret to zero and the zero stop. For the zero stop, you can look at informational videos on USO. I won't go over that, but the, it's really easy to, to reset the zero. There's a locking collar. You pull it up to lock the turret. You loosen the top set screw just barely, so you can just barely loosen it, which disengages the internals. You drop the locking collar back down. You set your turret back to zero. Pull it up to lock it. 
and then tighten your top set screw back down and there's your, your elevation turret is is zero and you're ready to go at the top of the turret you'll see this screw here that's basically what, what that is it's a rev counter so when you turn the 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 turret the e-rec knob a full rev that screw will come flush with the top of your turret and that's that's a really nice option to have for a lot of the guys that are shooting longer ranges so you you know if you've made a full revolution or not uh, you know uh, while we're talking about this you know we're uh, another thing too that, that we we're, we're you know a little bit of bragging it was pretty cool we were the first guys to get kills with the b-series optics you know it's it's really cool to be able to work with some of these companies as i said before but we were actually the first guys to get kills with the b17 and the b25 and they were prototype optics so it, it was pretty cool to work with these guys another thing too that they've allowed us to do is design our own reticle and i'll throw that up here on the screen so you guys can take a look at it It'll only be offered in the B25, unfortunately, right now. I'm trying to get them to put it in the B17, but I will go over a, a couple of the features and why I designed that reticle how we did. The, the reticle that we designed is the T1H field reticle. I'm gonna throw it up on the screen for you guys to take a look at it for a couple minutes. It's designed for hunting. It's, it's offered in the first focal plane, which a lot of guys don't understand. For us, it's a necessity. Being able to change the, the magnification on our optic and still have that reticle maintain the same value is a, is a must for us out here when we're taking you know shots anywhere from 50 yards out to four to 500 yards. These platforms are designed to be, you know, if we hold our own 100% effective from zero to 400. But the, the reticle is as follows, guys. Uh, you know, we, we're precision hunters. We reload all of our ammo, we build our rifles, cater to us, and that's how we design this reticle. It's a really fine reticle, it's illuminated. The reason that I, that I chose it to, to have such fine lines is because on first focal plane optics, when you zoom in your magnification, that reticle maintains the value so it changes with that that magnification the the more you zoom in the bigger the reticle gets and there's a lot of times on certain reticles that are in the first focal plane when you zoom them in it does cover up a target at a certain distance so we made a fine a fine crosshair the crosshairs intersect but they're center floating so the the horizontal and the vertical crosshairs there is some space around the center crosshairs that that don't touch and the reason for that is so that you can see fur around it you know it's not covering up your target when you're on a high magnification on the horizontal crosshair you know, another cool thing that i think a, a lot of optics manufacturers or a lot of reticle uh, manufacturers should integrate is hold windage hold for a running animal you know for example we, we could get into the math on things for running coyote but the general rule of thumb at 100 yards, a coyote running full value to you, you hold a baseball bat's length and it'll get you on fur. You know, a baseball bat's length at 100 yards is, is roughly 30 minutes. So on this horizontal crosshair, we have a larger hash at 10, a larger hash at 20, and a larger hash at 30. You put that, that 30 minute hash on a coyote running full value at 100 yards and it's gonna put you on fur. fur. It, it, a really easy, nice option to have when you're hunting and you don't have to use that same principle just strictly applied to coyotes i mean you can use it for deer you can use it for elk you can use it for any game animal that you may be hunting looking down it is kind of a christmas tree reticle you guys will see that i do have the even hashes numbered down to 10. it's an moa based reticle and each hash is one moa we have the even numbers down to 10 numbered just for a quick reference and another thing too this is kind of based off of our, our shooting at a quarter of a mile with these platforms. But at the two MOA hash, you have two minutes of usable windage. At the four MOA hash for hold, you have four usable minutes for windage and so on down to 10. The, the mindset behind the numbered elevation hold and the correlating windage hold is just for an easy referencing point. Like I said, if you hold 10 minutes for elevation, you know automatically that you have 10 usable minutes for windage.
and, and the same goes for eight, six, four, and two. All right, I think that's all I want to touch base on that. Let's go to, let's take a look at the barrel, guys. We designed this rifle to be a little bit lighter than, than our other rifles that we do carry. You know, we just kind of did some brainstorming, thought we'd test it out, see if we could build a lightweight hunting rifle with kind of a heavier contoured barrel. And, you know, barrel manufacturers are honestly kind of hard to work with. I, I tell a lot of guys, you know, a, a barrel's like a set of tires on your vehicle. You burn them off and you put new ones on. It's the same thing with the barrel. If you shoot a lot, you burn it down, you take it off, and you put a new one on. And barrel manufacturers know that. You know, they know guys need them. Guys that shoot use a lot of them. So when we hooked up with a Hardy Rifle Engineering out of New Zealand, you know, we were, we were, we were pretty jacked, especially knowing that they made high-end carbon fiber barrels. Uh, my initial impressions of the barrel, where the carbon fiber wrap met the shank, seamless, seamless transition. Where the carbon fiber uh, wrap met the, the muzzle, the steel muzzle, again, seamless transition. It, it, it looked good. We took them up to Chad. When they indexed them, one of the rifles was indexed at a half a thou, and the other two were, were right around a thou. So everything looked good on paper until, you know, I'm always skeptical until we shoot it. And if these didn't shoot, we wouldn't be doing a review on it right now. But this barrel's threaded uh, half by 28 for the suppressor. Of course, the shank's threaded uh, an inch and a 16th by 20 for the, uh, for the action. The twist rate is one and eight, and it has six R grooves. For those of you guys that aren't familiar with the grooves with the five R here in America, like the old, like the Obermeyer five R's or Remington's got five R's, your, your standard lands are cut more of a, of a 90 degree like this, where the R grooves or the R lands, I should say, are cut more of like a, a, a little bit open angle, like a 120. And there's, you know, there's some, there's some guys that, that say, you know, it helps decrease fouling and you get a better velocity, but I'm not going to be that guy to tell you that because we don't, you know, I haven't done enough testing to be able to determine that or not. I do know that these barrels shoot very well. And, you know, after about the first 10 rounds down them, we cleaned them and there was minimal to zero fouling right off the bat. So, you know, Hardy Rifle Engineering, great barrels, precision uh, quality. They shoot very good. When we get done with this, with this review, we're gonna shoot some groups and show you guys how well they shoot using the 60 grain cutting edge bullet Raptors. Uh, is there some, anything else on that barrel? Oh, oh, oh yeah, yeah, one more thing. Uh, another thing I should note on these barrels, we did get an exclusive contour with Hardy and that's the Ops Contour. What it is is it's real similar to the M24 Contour. It tapers down to almost an inch but you can see these barrels do have, you know, a, a kind of a unique look where you can see the chamber and then it flows down and it's just a straight taper down to the muzzle. So our, our contours are really close to the M24s, but it's not really a, a tapered gradual contour. It's, it's, it's contoured with the, with the chamber and then the rest of the barrel is kind of a straight taper from the edge of the chamber on down to the muzzle. End of the barrel. Let's take a look at the suppressor, guys. This is the SRT Arms 224 Vapor Suppressor manufactured by SRT Arms, designed in part by us. This is an inch and a half outside diameter, seamless aerospace titanium hydraulic tubing. It's eight inches long with uh, in canal blast baffle for a lifetime of, of service and performance as well as 6AL 4V titanium baffles and end caps. We've killed, how, we've killed hundreds of coyotes with these guys. Uh, they're, they're made for precision. They're one of the best sounding suppressors that I've used and they're catered for the high velocity 224 calibers. An, an awesome setup guys and, and that's exactly how we designed them. There, this, this, this rifle system was designed with one thing in mind, and that's for killing. So, you know, if you guys have any questions on it, be sure to ask us. Another company, another great company that we work with, I'll make sure and make a note of is, is Tony Burke's Tab Gear. 
uh, we've got the multi-cam arid Nomex suppressor cover here. It's a, an awesome option to have because not, not, we, we don't use it because it looks cool. We don't use it to try and uh, protect our suppressor. As you can see, the end of the suppressor is all beat to piss. We use it for a purpose. It's a mirage cover. You get about two to three rounds down this and you start to get a mirage with the higher magnifications and it really aids in, in suppressing that mirage when you need it suppressed. And of course, like all of our other rifles, built with precision by Precision Machines by Long Rifles Inc. You know, Chad and his team up there do phenomenal work. We highly recommend them for Serico work, for chambering, for threading muzzles, everything or anything that you can think of, blueprint and actions uh, to do with precision firearms. Callie also, Callie's the one that keeps everything in line. Pretty sure that uh, if she wasn't there, Chad would probably be uh, working on, on a GTO or driving around on a little mini bike or wrecking, wrecking remote control airplanes. <laughs> and that will be put on there. Long Rifles Inc, guys, you guys check them out. www.longriflesinc.com. Talk to Chad, ask for Chad on the phone because he's willing to talk with you about anything. Right, real quick before we get finished up here we're going to shoot a few three shot groups at 110 yards with the Mark 1 with the B17 a couple with the the motto with the LR20 with the LR17 and then a couple with the Mark 1 and the ER25 we're going to be using uh we haven't worked up any loads for these yet so we're we're hoping to get half MOA. We're using 60 grain cutting edge bullets, high end brass, Lapua, Norma, Nosler, and Federal Gold Medal Match 210 primers. 110 yards, let's see what we got. I hope you guys enjoyed our review of the CR Mod O Mark I. I hope you found it entertaining, but more importantly, I hope you found it informational. Hey, if you guys are liking what you're seeing and you're liking what we do, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Check out our Facebook and Instagram pages. Stop by O'NeillOps.com where you can read up into more detail about who we are and what we do. Once again, guys, I'm James O'Neill, and this has been an O'Neill Ops weapon review from the field with the equipment that is designed for the field. O'Neill Ops, we're out.